Hi, I'm Scott Feinberg with The Hollywood Reporter. Thank you for joining us for a close up with The Hollywood Reporter Writer's Edition. Uh, this week, I am very honored to be joined by five tremendous writers who are responsible for some of the year's best screenplays and films. And so I'm going to just briefly introduce them. Uh, Rada Blank, the writer of 40 Year Old Version, an original screenplay about a, a grieving and frustrated playwright and high school teacher who takes up rapping on the side as she nears her 40th birthday and contemplates what artistic compromises she is and isn't willing to make to achieve success. Rada, thank you so much for being with us. Emerald Fennell, the writer of Promising Young Woman, an original screenplay about a talented young woman who was traumatized by something terrible that happened to her friend and who now spends much of her time on a mission to address the wrongs and wrongdoers of the past. Sam Levinson, the writer of Malcolm and Marie, an original screenplay about a young couple, the man, a filmmaker, the woman, an actress, whose long repressed frustrations with each other explode as they return from the premiere of his new film and await its reviews. Thank you, Sam, for being here. Kemp Powers, the writer of One Night in Miami, a screenplay adapted from his own 2013 play of the same name about a gathering of four famous black men, activist Malcolm X, singer Sam Cooke, football star Jim Brown, and boxer Cassius Clay, one evening in 1964. And also the writer with Pete Docter and Mike Jones of Soul, an original screenplay about a middle school music teacher whose body and soul are separated just hours before he is to realize his lifelong dream of being a big time jazz performer. Kemp, thank you. And last but certainly not least, Aaron Sorkin, the writer of The Trial of the Chicago 7, an original screenplay about a varied group of countercultural protesters at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago who find themselves on trial with the whole world watching. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, great to have you all here. And especially during this weird time for the country, the world, um, with the pandemic, with unrest in our society. And in fact, I'd like to start there and just ask you, have you guys as writers found that it is easier or harder to get work done during the last few crazy months? By the crazy time, are you talking about COVID? Are you talking about the insurrection? Are you, are, are you talking about everything? Everything. Throw it all in there. <laughs> Take a pick. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, listen. Uh, I'm, as as far as COVID goes, uh, it, it hasn't affected writing at all. It, that's something you do by yourself. Um, uh, obviously, it's having a big effect on production. Um, uh, it it's having a it has had a devastating effect on the theater. Um, uh, for you know, some of us are playwrights too. As for the rest, yeah, sometimes it's hard to concentrate, but honestly, sometimes it's a welcome place to go. Um, uh, you know, if you can really get into the groove of whatever it is you're working on, uh, it's, I, I found it to be a nice break from, uh, from what's going on. Sam, your entire film was written, directed, edited, entirely put together during the pandemic. What was, was it an escape for you or, or how did you uh, get, make that happen? Um, I mean, I think it was a couple of things. Just, you know, we had been shut down on Euphoria, I think the day before we were supposed to start shooting season two. And it's always one of those things when you're trying to hold your your crew together, you know, for for like a nine month shoot like that, where you're going, don't take another job. We're going to go. We're going in March. We're going to do it. And when we got shut down, I think the first anxiety that I had is, well, uh, you know, how's anyone going to earn a living and, you know, how are people going to get paid? How are they going to put food on the table? And so I think out of that, you know, I started thinking, well, if, if I could write something, if, if we could do something safely and then com further conversations I had with Zendaya and with uh, my wife, Ash and Kevin Turin, um, it was sort of born out of how do we get everybody back to work safely? Um, and, and how can we, you know, um, because if I, if I can write something that can get us there and we can all, you know, uh, do this in a safe manner where we're quarantining, then um, then maybe we could take our findings and what we've learned and, you know, and share it with the rest of the community. 
So it, it, you know, its inception was kind of backwards in, in a, in a, in a way, but, um, but I think it, it, it helped create this, this feeling of, of family. And, and also at the same time, we were able to, to give kind of all of our, our, you know, uh, you know, key department heads ownership in the film so that, you know, uh, in its success, they could also share in the benefits. Have you guys, I, I mean, I think we should also take this moment to note that all of you are directors on your films with the exception of One Night in Miami, where uh, that is Regina King's feature directorial debut, but Kemp's co-director on Soul. Everybody else is director of their film. And um, so, you know, I know that Rada and Kemp and quite possibly Emerald, you guys were dealing with um, kind of post-production on aspects of your film during the shutdown. But I guess I'm wondering whether it's that work, whether it's creating new material for future projects, do you find it, uh, is it sort of cathartic to get back to work or is it, uh, is it just hard to focus in the way that you're used to? I think that the, the key word that you use there, Scott, was future. Um, and to me, writing is kind of like an act of faith, right? Like you're, you're honing on an, in on an idea that you hope will manifest in a performance uh, that an audience sees. And um, it's taken me a second to get there. I mean, I, I did have an engine behind um, around the time COVID, uh, the lockdown first happened. It was an engine in that we had an October 9th um, you know, release date. And so I was working remotely editing the film in New York with my editor at the time, Daisha Broadway, um, at, you know, <laughs> with her system set up in LA. Um, so I had that engine, but just the idea of new ideas and this future, um, I struggle and I still am struggling with it because there just seem to be at times some very prescient things, you know, just around survival, especially in a black body, you know, where people who look like me aren't making it out there. And so I can't help but see myself in them and their experience, whether it's COVID or, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know? <laughs> so um, there were times when I felt, if I'm being completely honest, a little self-indulgent <laughs> to be thinking about a production or, you know, um, making film, um, but I've, I've come back around to realize, especially because a lot of my uh, respite was in story, was watching other people's films and it kind of pulling me out of, which were some, you know, what I would call, consider some really dark times, you know, because uh, I we all were kind of witnessing the destruction of COVID, but also witnessing, you know, what happened with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And so I, I did have this question of identity, you know, mm -hmm. as a storyteller and I've, I've come back around, but at the time um, I, I struggled to think of new worlds when I was just trying to figure out how to get through the one I was living through, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm in a better place, but I'm still, there's still a lot of questions about what it means to create something for this phantom audience. Um, just in terms of the film, like you don't shoot a 35 millimeter black and white film for it to be seen on a tablet or a phone. Well, you know what I mean? Like, and so like I've had to <laughs> I had to make some pivots and changes there in terms of how we share this film. Yes, it's on Netflix, which means there's a broader audience for it. But ultimately, I'm a cinephile. And, and the dream is like to show it at Walter Reed at Lincoln Center. You know what I mean? And so there are all these little shifts I think we're all having to make. Um, but I think the biggest one is like just for me personally, is like, what is my purpose as a storyteller? And so I'm still kind of grappling with that when the idea of sharing story is changing. Yeah. Well, uh, Kemp, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. And also about the part, the point that Rada raised, which is that you guys made these films, assuming most people are going to, I would think, see it on a big screen. Now, Disney Plus has a large audience that is seeing uh, soul and we've heard you know you, you get quick feedback we're hearing earlier from, before we went on the air Sam's uh, children or son I believe is is uh, you know has a lot of questions about soul you know it's, it's getting to people but um, just how you feel about the fact that it's not on a big screen for most people as well you know of course we're really lucky that we have a device to get it out to people the way mm -hmm that Disney plus allows us to do it. And I mean, I don't ever want to seem like I'm being thankless, but at the same time, 
we made it to be on a big screen. When we when we finaled Soul at um, Skywalker, when we did the final mix at Skywalker Ranch, it was an experience that I know that the people who are seeing it now aren't, aren't going to be able to replicate. Part of me, I jokingly said to a friend, you know, I wish we could fly to China so I could see Soul in a movie theater with a, with an audience right now because that's mm. pretty much what you need to do. Yeah. And but but at the same time, like you know, we we were initially supposed to come out in June. Um, we shut down about seven weeks before we finished production, so about forty five percent of the film still needed to be animated. And but the one thing about animation is COVID animation didn't slow down at all. I I mean, in fact. And I feel like everyone's trying to like do more animation because mm-hmm. they feel like it's the one thing that can be be done during this lockdown. But it is very strange to be just having like a very normal, incredibly busy work day while it feels like the world is coming down around your ears outside. So mm-hmm. I found myself, guilt isn't the right word, but you, uh, Rada said like, you feel self-indulgent. You know, the fact that we're just like in edit and we're finaling shots and dailies and we're just not talking about anything that's happening because we're so busy trying to hit our deadlines, which we did hit. We finished mm-hmm. Soul on time for that June release. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a peculiar, surreal um, experience. It's not what any of us expected. But at the same time, it came out on Christmas and in a strange, t- if there is such a thing as fate, it felt like that was exactly when that film should have come out. So and, and we should note that uh, some people, I believe, are calling Christmas this called this past Christmas Kempmas because they got not only yeah. Soul but also One Night in Miami on Amazon. So that was- I was calling it Kempmas. Um, <laughs> you know, in addition to uh, you know the move that the movie won't be on a big screen and won't have a, a theater sound system. Uh, the the big thing I'll, I I miss. And also, I am obviously grateful to Netflix um, uh, that it was just like a lifeboat coming along that had VIP cabins and a buffet. Uh, <laughs> but I'll bet that none of us have ever seen our movie with an audience. I'll, I'll bet that an audience has never seen uh, our films. And the difference is, is all the difference. Uh, uh, that shared experience everybody laughing at the same time, everybody silent at the same time, gasping at the same time, crying at the same time, feeling the end of the film resonate uh, at the same time. Uh, I'm, I am clinging to the belief uh, that, uh, that once it's safe, we're going to want that back, that, that nothing will ever be a substitute for that experience and that people will go back to theaters. I'm going to ask yeah, Emerald, of I, course, for, I, for, her taking. I was just, oh, yeah, sorry, I was just going to say one one quick thing, which is, and I know it's not the way it was intended to be seen, Kemp, but being able to sit, you know, in bed with my four year old and my wife on New Year's Eve and watch Soul, and to be able to actually pause it and talk it through with my four year old who had so many questions and was so moved and in awe of it, was such a unusual and beautiful experience that I think made the film more profound for him, for me as a father, and just about kind of uh, about life in a way. It's like just the questions that it raised. And I'm not sure if we took him to the theater to go see it, it would have been, he would have had the, the same experience in the sense that there were so many new ideas that were being presented that I'm not sure he would have been able to, to, to sort of wrestle with them all piece by piece. And so it provided this kind of extraordinary viewing experience that was unlike pretty much any film I've ever watched with him before. So for what it's worth, it it had an impact in a a really major way. At the end of the day, and I'm just talking, if I'm being completely honest, I felt relieved considering black people are inordinately affected by COVID to not have to ask a single black person to go to a movie theater and risk their life to see my damn movie. So in many ways, that was a relief to, <laughs> to just because I didn't want to do that. Um, I so so I hear you. I mean, again, I'm very thankful. I'm I'm super. I, I get it. It's just that again, you you these films yeah. take years to make, 100%. and at no point during those years did you just see like, no, it's not going to be <laughs> in, in a theater. But but again, I'm my my it's it's a by far a net positive, and I'm really thankful that 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 it was able to get out the way that it was. 
I want to come for just a second, Emerald, bear with me. I want to quickly follow up with Aaron about one thing, which is that your, your film has had an interesting journey because this was originally with the oldest studio that's literally based in Hollywood, Paramount, and it ended up at the, the new kid in town, Netflix. Yeah. Why, why? And this was all during the pandemic. So can you just give us a little bit of context about why that was something that you wanted to happen? Sure. Well, uh, back in in the spring, uh, uh, I was on a marketing call uh, with the, the marketing team at Paramount and Jim Giannopoulos, um, uh, the head of Paramount. Uh, and at the end of the call, he said, listen, uh, we've done some market research um, uh, to try to find out when people are going to come back to movie theaters. Uh, the first group of people that's going to come back are the people who think that COVID is a hoax. Um, so, uh, and, and I knew, and he was saying, you know, should we, uh, we, 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 the film couldn't be pushed a year. We wanted it to come out before uh, the election. Not, not because we thought we could persuade anybody or affect the election in any way, uh, but just because right now is, is when we're talking about these things. And uh, uh, so uh, Jim Giannopoulos at the end of the call said, should we at least, uh, uh, you know, check out uh, uh, the streamers and what their appetite for the film uh, would be. I agreed with Jim Giannopoulos that chances are the Idaho militia was not going to show up for the film uh, on opening weekend uh, and that we might be in trouble. Um, and uh, uh, Netflix came along uh, and uh, made Paramount a financial offer that was attractive uh, 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 to them. Uh, they guaranteed the film three weeks in theaters. I'm not sure that anybody went, but it was nice uh, that I was available in theaters uh, for three weeks. Uh, and we all got along great. I'm incredibly, not just grateful to Netflix, I have to say I'm really impressed uh, uh, with them, uh, and in particular their marketing department. Um, but uh, I, I've had nothing but uh, a fantastic experience with them. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to just very quickly yeah. uh, second what he's saying. Um, uh, and also to go back to say that I did have six audiences at Sundance at the top of the year. So I, I did get Sundance, that of amazing yeah. experience. Um, but it's the same thing where I feel like, you know, there are, pe there are certain people who don't have an art house cinema <laughs> to go to. And so Netflix brings it to them. I have family in Trinidad who got to see it. And um, I think if there's buzz around the film, it is because it's on Netflix. Um, and it, who, who've been nothing but supportive. They gave me a 35 millimeter print of my film. You know what I mean? And we also had like a week, I think we had a week long because we were in the smack dab in the middle of like, the uh, so we had a week long. So it was in the theaters and there were, you right. know, and people would go and there'd be two people in, <laughs> in the theater. But, you know, um, I, I feel the same way as Kemp. It was, it was, it was nerve wracking at the time. Yeah. Um, and and, and hoping nice. we can come back and show it when things clear up. Yeah, and I will just note quickly that, you know, what, what happened with Trial, starting with a studio going to a streamer is now happening with others as well. The United States versus Billy Holiday has gone from Paramount to Hulu. There are others where this is happening, but I wanna come to Emerald. Thank you for your patience. And I wanna just note, you have experienced all of this from the other side of the pond. You are in the UK. And I just wonder um, what it's been like for you in terms of, uh, you know, your experience with your film, but also just, um, you know, watching what watching what's happening over here at where people are, you know, a lot of the a lot of the industry is still, you know, based and, and just dealing with what we're dealing with at the moment. It doesn't feel real. I think like a lot of this year, whether it's been personal or professional, um, it feels like we're all kind of operating in this strange sort of stasis. So much is happening outside, but you kind of, you feel it completely, kind of psychologically you understand it, but it's very difficult to, fe it, it, it feels different almost to anything. And I think that's compounded by being in England. And um, uh, I made my film in America. I've always loved America. And I think like a lot of, children all over the world. I look to America for 
movies and TV and books, all the books that I read, I was obsessed with, you know, everything, diners and cheerleaders and prom, all these things, you know, we didn't have. And so I've always loved it. And I think, you know, of course, like anyone, it's, it's just shock. It's shocking. There's, there's no, no other thing for it. It's really shocking and deeply troubling and strange. But also for me this year, just what has been quite interesting, and I and I don't know if other people have experienced this too, um, on the panel I'm, in general, I, I know they have, but I have a very young child. So I found weirdly that my world, my real world has physically shrunk to something very domestic. And, you know, having gone from literally like Radha, ha having gone from Sundance where, you know, we were all so lucky to be in seeing the movie with an audience and that being, you know, truly one of the most remarkable, terrifying, amazing experiences of my life. And then coming back to England, immediately being shut down with a very adorable, very psychotic baby, <laughs> suddenly sort of flung me into, yes, this sort of, this sort of tiny, lovely, strange world. So the idea of being able to work, of being able to write, luckily I've had to because of deadlines and quite strict producers, but it's been harder than I thought, certainly. And um, I, I think what for me this year, very selfishly, it's particularly with everything else that is enormous going on, I think, Selfishly, I've realized how much writing uh, is a, is therapy really for me and a relief, actually. I find it hu a huge, the only way I can describe it is relief. Um, and so not being able to do that, not having the physical space even to do that has been quite um, strange and discomforting. But honestly, you know, to say that <laughs> when the world is as it is and the circumstances are literally life or death feels supremely sort of selfish and ridiculous so I think like everyone I go on this roller coaster of um feeling slightly sorry for myself and then immediately chastising myself for being ridiculous when um really these are this, you know me not being able to write is not really truly a, a problem a real well problem. we we should note that we have uh you guys to thank for your films that you're here speaking about today but we all, in terms of keeping our you know minds off what's going on outside of our doors but we also have to thank uh emerald for a lot of hours of terrific work in front of the camera on the crown which i guess was all in the all locked before any of this happened obviously um and do you have any sense of i guess that they're not are, are they able to move forward with the next season anytime soon or what's their game plan i think luckily i think every two seasons they have a two-year hiatus mm -hmm. so actually i think and because they literally stopped i think we stopped the last week of shooting mm -hmm. just by luck um and so actually i think that they'll be all right um yeah. yeah so let's talk a little bit about the specific kind of origin stories of each of these projects that you guys are representing here today uh they some of them are come from very personal I'm, I'm sure all of them to some degree are very personal but literally from personal experiences others are you know dealing with historical events and then there are things in between Rada yours I think is probably the most autobiographical if not entirely autobiographical can you just explain um you know this character Rada in your film shares quite a lot in common with you so what inspired her and um and inspired you to also get in front of the camera which i think you're great in front of the camera but i've heard you say it's not where you're most at home yeah no it's this is probably my first and last acting <laughs> job um i have too much respect for actors to even call myself an actor um and it wasn't you know i'm not playing a mother of four from flint michigan you know what i'm saying who has to yeah, challenge her city government around the poisoning of the water. Um, I, I'm playing myself. So even calling it a character is, you know, 75% uh, of the film is, is real. We shot in my apartment. That is my annoying big brother. Um, that's my father's music, my mom's artwork. And so um, I kind of was just pulling from my own, you know, I don't have the training. So 
I was just pulling from my own uh, inner storytelling in terms of like the choices and stuff. But yeah, no, I think like uh, maybe other people would agree that, you know, it kind of came out of adversity. Um, I'd gotten fired off of a job of a film that's coming out. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I got fired off of this job and um, I wasn't necessarily a young writer, but I was new. I'd just gotten into the Guild and it was such a big deal that I got my this screenwriting credit and I was devastated. I mean, I wish someone would have told me like, you're gonna get fired, that, that shit is gonna happen. Um, but I didn't know it at the time and I was just like, oh my God, I'll never work again. And um, but it gave me the fuel to like my char character there. I said it, um, create something that was my own, you know? So I was like, I'm, I'm going to do a web series. Fuck this shit. I'm going to write it, direct it, produce it, star in it. So I can't get fired. Um, and um, as life would have it two weeks before we were going to shoot the first few episodes, uh, my mom passed away and my mom and I were very, 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 very close. We shared a birthday and, um, you know, I uh, scrapped the project because I was just like, if my biggest champ and cheerleader is not here to see it, um, then I'm not interested. I mean, she was the first cinephile in my life. She's turned me on to everyone from Lon Chaney to um, Hal Ashby, John Cassavetes, Sidney Lumet, you name it, uh, Kathleen Collins. And so um, I just, you know, pushed away from that. But I had created all this music on GarageBand um, as Rodimus <laughs> Prime and just started going out and performing it. And I did that for two years. <laughs> so that was my catharsis. Then when I came back to look at the, the web series, it was just, it felt like it was a, a millennials game, you know, platform. And that's when I just started transforming it. The, 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 the web series, which were 10 episodes I never shot, ended up becoming the outline for the feature. And um, yeah, like it's, it's, Funny to me how much life imitates art, imitates life. I was telling someone the other day that, you know, I was fortunate enough to be on that uh, 10 to watch list. And I got off the stage with my award uh, sitting on my bosom. And a uh, white theater producer, uh, film producer was like, congratulations, this is awesome. I'm looking for a writer for my film about a runaway slave. And uh, in that moment, I said, wow, I can't escape this shit. It just will not go away. So yeah, I'm, I'm pulling from my own life, um, but I, I hope that when I move into the next project that I can show that, I, that there's so much more interesting things in my own life and I will not at all be working for my own personal story. But that's where it came, came from, is that personal adversity of the death of my mom and losing that job and yeah. And so I'm sitting with these amazing people. I think that's what gives your film such fire and like humor and it just, that's what makes it so uh, just unbelievably raw and fresh. And something I haven't seen is all of that pent up frustration, <laughs> getting fire never, it's just it, that, that rap, the poverty porn rap is just so brilliant. And the reaction to it, when you turn around and I, I know you don't like acting, but you are so gifted. And when you turn around to the producer and you go, that felt good is just <laughs> one of the greatest moments. Um, uh, thank you. Sorry, I, I just had to, I love that. I appreciate it, Sam. So there's the deeply personal, which Rod is dealing with. And then there is uh, something that Aaron, I was, you know, the story of, of your sort of discovery of the history of the trial of Chicago seven is, is fascinating because I'll, well, take it away. Okay. Um, well, it was it was 14 years ago uh, uh, in 2006. Uh, I was asked to come to Steven Spielberg's house on a Saturday morning, and just to be clear, that's that's not common. I don't hang out with Steven Spielberg. Um, and he said he wanted to make a movie about the Chicago Seven, and I said that sounds great. Count me in. It's a great idea. Uh, and I left his house and called my father and asked him who the Chicago Seven were. <laughs> um, I, I was just saying yes to doing a movie with Steven Spielberg, uh, the way, you know, I think anyone would. Uh, uh, so I had a lot of learning to do and, um, there are a dozen or so good books about the Chicago seven, some of them written by the defendants themselves. There's a 21,000 page trial transcript, but most critically, I got to spend time with Tom Hayden, uh, who was alive, uh, at the, he, he passed away a few years ago, but he was very much alive. Uh, back then. Uh, 
and then came for me what is always a, a long period of climbing the walls and and pacing around. Uh, it's it's the very worst part of the, the writing process. Uh, I, writing is great. Not writing is 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 terrible. Um, and and I have to say, uh, now that I've I've directed the last couple of films uh, that I've written and I'm in prep to uh, to direct another one, I've said that as hard as directing is, uh, uh, and and it is uh, hard. Two things. When you come to work in the morning, there is an instruction manual uh, about what you're supposed to do. It's the script, uh, right? Uh, that isn't the case when you sit down to write. You're staring at a blank piece of paper or a blank screen with a blinking cursor. Uh, but as hard as directing is, at least at the end of the day, you've done a day's work. Um, and uh, as a writer, at least with me, there are so many days that go by uh, where I I didn't write anything. I, I'm just stuck. I, I drove the car into uh, a snowbank uh, uh, where I just I I can't really see the movie. I don't know how to start. It's too big uh, to get my arms around. Anyway, you 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 somehow get through that and uh, and you start writing. And in in my case, uh, that first draft. Um, can easily be two or three hundred pages long. I, I, I deliver my first drafts in a shopping bag. Um, uh, but by getting to the end, by getting to fade out, uh, you have learned a lot about what the movie's about uh, now, um, and you start to learn, uh, you know, what to cut away, what to hang a lantern on, uh, what you're focusing on. Anyway, it the, the film then went through the hands of every member of the DGA. Um, uh, Stephen decided he was going to produce it, uh, but um, uh, but Paul Greengrass uh, uh, should direct it. So I was with Paul for a while. I was with Ben Stiller uh, uh, for a while um, uh, and, uh, and a few others. And the movie kept not getting made. Uh, and the, the reason was budget. Uh, the two riot sequences were were budget busters every time a line producer sat down uh, uh, to, to budget the film. A film like Chicago 7 obviously has to fit into a budget uh, that the studio thinks is proportional to what the audience appetite is going to be. In other words, it's not going to be a big budget <laughs> movie, uh, uh, The Trial of Chicago 7, and no one can figure out uh, how to do the riot sequences. That kept going on and on until Donald Trump ran for president and got elected president. And at his rallies, when there'd be a protester, he would get nostalgic about the old days when we'd carry that guy out of here on a stretcher and I'd like to punch him in the face and beat the crap out of him. Um, protest was demonized uh, in this country. Um, athletes, usually black athletes, were demonized for kneeling peacefully uh, during the national anthem. Uh, we saw those same people who had a problem with athletes kneeling during the national anthem, taking the American flag and breaking windows with it, beating cops with it. Okay, so I don't want to hear the national anthem argument anymore. Um, anyway, Donald Trump happened. Stephen said, uh, the time to make this movie is now. By then, I had directed my first film. I directed Molly's Game. And he was sufficiently pleased with that, that he thought I should direct Chicago 7, and he said, uh, now the riots are your problem. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, uh, Thanks, you pulled it off very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Kemp, I mean, we've, you have also gone on this journey of, of taking a, a play that you wrote again back in 2013 to uh, the screen um, in the case of One Night in Miami. And I just wonder if you can share what was going on in your life at the t that prompt, you know, that sort of at the time you decided to write the play and then take us through the seven plus years from the play to having it now uh, uh, your first produced screenplay? Well, it's interesting because I probably when I when I wrote the play, I had no intention on ever adapting it into a film. And it's only because of some of the things that Rada discusses in her film um, about being a black playwright that forced me to kind of, if I'm going to get this story out, I guess theater is not going to be the medium. 
So because the people question the viability of that story as a play. That's the, the great irony of seeing some critics say it's too much like a play as a movie. And it's like, oh, you must not have been there when it was a play. And they said it wasn't worthy of being a play because nothing happens in the room. So I'm in this endless loop where my shit doesn't work as a play or a movie. And I'm just like, I feel okay, you, man. Guy. And, and I'm like, oh, no one ever saw 12 Angry Men. You know what I mean? Like you couldn't. But anyway, <laughs> so you can go back to the beginning. Um <laughs> In my oh, previous life, I was a journalist and, um, you know, I, it was about, I think, 15 years ago that I read this incredible book um, by the late Mike Marcusi. He was a sports journalist called Redemption Song, Muhammad Ali and the Spirit of the 60s. And it was about the intersection between the civil rights movement and pro sports. Um, so the focus was heavily Ali. And there was just that one paragraph on that night, uh, February 25th, 1964, um, when Cassius beat Sonny Liston. He did go back to Malcolm X's hotel room in the then still segregated Miami, um, the Hampton House, and he spent the night with Malcolm, Jim Brown, Sam Cooke over bowls of vanilla ice cream in conversation. And the next morning is when he um, announced that he was in the Nation of Islam. So, you know, you have to understand at the time that I read that, those are my four heroes. You know, I mean, I'm Generation X, so like Malcolm X is our patron saint. But for my generation of young men, like reading the autobiography is is, is, a, is a seminal moment as a young man in high school where you're like, you know what, after reading this, I'm not taking this damn test. So, you know, it's a, <laughs> it, it brings out, it, it brings out the, the innate militant in, in, in all of us as, as young men. But I initially set out doing research, wondering how they became friends um, with the intention of writing a book. Um, it was one of those books that many journalists research and never get around to writing. And just coincidentally, as my journalism career was ending and my creative writing career was picking up as a playwright. Uh, I was thinking of ideas to um, do as a, a stage play. And the thing that had stymied me in writing the book, which was I couldn't really figure out much of what was said in the room, it felt very theatrical. And I, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of have this discussion that I really think, you know, Black folks have been having since way before that night. They're having it now. It's like, what if any social responsibility does the Black artist, singer, athlete, have to his or her people. And, you know, it's so funny that when I, when I started writing it, I never could have envisioned things like what Colin Kaepernick's doing, um, a conservative news host telling LeBron James to just shut up and dribble. But, she, but you know what I mean? Like, I wanted to show that for a country that demands that we just be quiet and be good citizens, People need to understand that we're as much citizens as everyone else. We're as much Americans as everyone else. But we were reminded from a very early age that we're not quite American by people who are the descendants of immigrants who came here after us. And it puts you in a really fucked up place in your psyche. And no amount of fame or wealth will remove that from your life. You know, it was only a couple of years ago that the N-word was spray painted on LeBron's house here in Hollywood. So, you know, it's, it's just like we're, we, we never get away from it. And I thought it was important to show that um, these great men who inspired so much of us were just human beings and they had to have struggled with these things. So it was really selfishly a chance to kind of have a, give an audience a chance to have a fly in the wall conversation that me and my buddies have been having for, for years. And again, the, the translating it into a film, I initially didn't even want to option it, um, but as the play hit walls and people didn't want to produce it because it wasn't viable for uh, first a regional audience and then a Broadway or a West End audience, we, we got nominated for an Olivier Award and didn't transfer to the West End. These things start, these failures start piling up and it doesn't, and even though you're breaking records, you're, you're selling out runs, it's still your, the viability of your voice is questioned. I was moving into Hollywood and I'd been, hired and fired from some jobs. And I was getting to the point where I felt like my screenwriting capabilities were, were good enough that, you know what, I'll option it now if I get a chance to write it myself, because I also was concerned about what Hollywood would do to this story. If they took this night, I feel like it would have been a different film. And there were people that were telling you, right? It's oh, yeah. only about Ali, right? Or Yeah, they were like, you did it all wrong. Oh, the only person anyone cares about is Muhammad Ali. No one knows who these other guys are. This Malcolm X is too controversial. 
You're told all these things by these people who know so much more than you do. And it makes you question your own voice. And it's, it's so funny that I got hired. Pete Doctor hired me at Pixar after reading my play one night in Miami. And, you know, that thing that people criticized and said didn't work um, was the thing that made what I saw as the house of master storytelling interested in my voice. They were like, you're different. You know, <laughs> we, we want to work with you. So it, it is a it is a it is a strange kind of dance we we go on in, in the journey of bringing these things to life, mm-hmm. isn't it? Well, Emerald, I want to talk about your journey because it's also um, you know you've you've taken a path that I don't think I would call common or well traveled. I mean, you were first, I think, an, an originally was your direction solely acting. That was your first um, path. So my first, I suppose my first job right out of university was acting. And then quite quickly, um, I realized that was going to be a lot of, I was going to have a lot of time off. (laughs) Um, So uh, I wrote books. So I was on a TV show in England called called The Midwife, which was wonderful. And um, in the hiatus every year, I wrote a book. And the first two were kind of horror for kids. Um, That famously popular genre. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, and the most recent one monsters was was um the kind of dark comedy for adults so it was that it uh, so I was kind of doing those two things alongside each other and then an amazing writer called Jessica Nappett um read my most recent book and asked me to come and work on her tv series and then really it kind of it, it went on from there but I've but I've always really written more than anything I think um, ever since I was small and always um, horrifically violent Um, lots of my parents being called in to offices asking if everything was okay if I was okay (laughs) Um, wow so it seemed (laughs) so 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 it's always been something I've loved and then quite quickly I think I realized like probably it sounds like everyone here actually that if I really wanted to make something I needed to make it not just write it but direct it too and in order to do that I made a short film I wrote and directed a short film that was very lucky went to Sundance and it was um in 2018 it was off the back of that that I was then able to kind of convince people that I could direct Promising Young Woman um so it was a very roundabout way but I think you know for most of us I suppose it sounds like everyone's come at it from different angles you just want to make things that's all I've ever wanted to do I went to um to Universal Studios when I was a child when I was probably seven or eight I'd just seen Jurassic Park in the cinema in America and I was so excited I threw up on myself but I wouldn't let my (laughs) it was when the velociraptors came into the kitchen um of course and I wouldn't let my mum take me out because I was so riveted that I just sat there just sat there Um, and then I went to Universal Studios and I remember seeing someone painting you know obviously it's a working studio and as well as the theme park and I saw someone painting the uh, gate of one of the houses there and I just thought oh okay so somebody does somebody does that job so if they do that job that is a job that I could do one day Um, and so yeah I suppose it was just that thing of making it like making it what a thrill to go onto a set to see to see a prop that you wrote to see someone pick it up to see the nail varnish that you painstakingly maniacally specified you know on someone's fingernails that stuff is it is a dream come true even if you're making something like promising a woman which is kind of in many ways quite like difficult I suppose it was still getting to make a movie in Los Angeles was, yeah, was and remains unlike anything in the world. And I want to hone in on what, you know, chronologically when that idea uh, for, for Promising a Woman came about, because obviously the last few years, especially in the town where all of us except you are now, are, are numerous of us, I'm not sure where everybody is, but, uh, you know, where this industry is, centrally located have uh been dealing with some dark stuff and uh and so i wonder did this 
was this in any way inspired by the Me Too movement of our industry or was this a separate thing? Well, it was a separate thing in the writing, um, but I think certainly it, it made people more open-minded perhaps about making something like this, particularly um, something that was more of a subversion of the revenge genre, I think, than it actually was a revenge movie in a traditional way. Um, but no, I, I started writing it, I think, you know, a, a while before. And it was, it was really, it was really more about a specific consent issue, something I grew up with. And I think a lot of, in fact, I think probably everyone my age grew up with this sort of like, you know, slightly older millennials, which was that using alcohol and drugs to, as a kind of means of seducing people was just completely normal that I wanted to talk about a kind of a gray area, I guess, of this stuff that was not a gray area when I was growing up very recently. You know, nothing that happens in my film isn't in a mainstream studio comedy of the last 10, 15 years or network comedies because, you know, girls waking up not knowing what happened to them the night before going on a walk, walk of shame, um, guys like filling up a girl's red cup at a, college party you know because they need to lose their virginity this is just stuff that happened and so that was the stuff I wanted to look at like what happens when everyone wakes up and realizes that so much of the and I would say this is the heavy heaviest biggest quotation marks what happens when seduction culture isn't seduction culture it's abusive you know and then and then also make it funny I mean, that was obviously, <laughs> so I suppose partly for me, it was, well, if you're going to talk about this stuff, it not only needs to be deeply serious, but it needs to be accessible and it needs to be pleasurable to some degree because that's part of its trap in the same way that, you know, a lot of people that seem nice on the surface aren't very nice. So, well, and yeah. just a quick follow-up about that. Uh, you all are in this season required at one time or another to I, to classify your film as a drama or a musical or a comedy or musical comedy or all these different labels, which I understand are reductive, but they're out there. And in some ways they help viewers decide what they want to see. And I, I found it interesting there. The, and this has been reported. It's, it's uh, you know, correct me if any of this is wrong, Emerald, but essentially with the Golden Globes, when your film was entered, they asked you, what do you see this as? And you suggested comedy rather than drama. Now, I have heard you speak, I've heard you explain why you feel that way, but there were people who were sort of outraged on your behalf because they felt that that was, a, they thought that was a, a decision by the Hollywood Foreign Press Association that was being imposed upon you, that was trying to make light of what you know, what is being dealt with in the film. So I just wonder if you can can give your rationale for if you have to choose between those labels, why you feel it is that. Well, I think also to be fair to the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, it is quite, a, it's necessarily a difficult film to categorize and it's it's both things. So to be fair, it could have been either. For me, it just says a lot about comedy in general because I think that we still have this idea that comedy equals levity. And I don't think that's true. I think comedy is actually probably the most devastating weapon you can use um, when you're talking about serious things. The most serious moments of my life have always been full of kind of, of humor. I think it's the only way I know of surviving. So um, yeah, so I, but I, I, I still think it is a dark comedy, but I'm also very happy to be in any category. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come to you, Sam, because we talked a little bit about the the climate in which your film came to be just all during this, this crazy pandemic period. But um, you obviously have a close working relationship with Zendaya from Euphoria, where, as I understand it, it's sort of a, she's sort of playing a female version of you at a younger age is this one now we've got a film about people in the business that in which you work um dealing with some of the uh you know challenges of 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 being in a relationship where both people are in that same field 
where did this idea come from? And uh, and just talk about that, if you would. Uh, well, I, I knew it had to be a movie that took place in one location, two actors, um, just for safety reasons and all that. So I thought, all right, well, what's a... And I knew I wanted it to be a relationship piece. So I thought, well, what's like a terrible thing that someone can do to their partner? And... And then I and then I thought, well, they could forget to thank them at the premiere of their film, um, which is something that happened to me uh, at, at one point. Although I will say what was interesting about it is um, we and I didn't even realize this until until my wife and producing partner Ash said something to me. She said, you know, we only talked about it on the car ride home from the premiere. And I said, we didn't talk about it any more than that. And she said, no, which completely shocked me because I had had a hundred million conversations in my own head about uh, how bad I felt about, you know, the process of it, why I forgot to think, you know, and so I thought it was an interesting uh, sort of way to kick off this relationship between this couple. And then I thought, well, what if he forgot to thank her, but the movie was also based on her. And what does that then do? What does it, what does it mean when you're actually, when you're a writer and you're taking parts of someone else's life and not acknowledging them? What is, you know, what role does authorship play in it? What role does, uh, how does that, how does that affect the relationship, the resentment? And then to just keep going from there. Well, why didn't, and then suddenly it's, well, when you wrote this, you originally wrote this for me. And I just kept trying to dig deeper into this fictional relationship that that kind of started with a with sort of an honest an honest mishap in my own life, but um, as just a means to kind of get at the at the core of of uh, of these characters. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a group of people here who I really want to hear your take on one of the hot button sort of conversations, debates that's going on in this industry, and I think beyond, but um, basically just about who can or should tell which stories. And this, uh, we saw it with recently, for instance, with Green Book, which was a film written and directed by white people, which dealt with race in a way that some people found problematic. There was a, sort of the white savior character. Obviously, a lot of other people didn't weren't deterred by that because it won best picture. Uh, you had a recent thing with a biopic about the Chinese concert pianist Lang Lang, which is coming uh, forthcoming. This was announced that Ron Howard was going to be directing it. That caused some backlash saying, how can Ron Howard understand Lang Lang's experience? But Lang Lang is a producer on it and, and apparently was okay with it himself. Uh, so I just, I guess I wonder if we can talk about this conversation because it's not, doesn't seem like it's going away. It's important. It's interesting. Um, Rada, your film certainly deals with the idea of gatekeepers and, and uh, who, in, in, who often in, in the creative arts happen to, you know, are white and how they then exert their, uh, their worldview on others. Uh, in your case, the theater producer wants to make a Harriet Tubman musical and your, your character strangles him. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, which is, I, I, I get it. Um, and, and uh, you know, Sam, you're, it, you're, you've got an interesting dynamic in that you are a white guy making a film with two black performers. I don't, is there any, is that, is there anything wrong with that? I don't know, written, having written and directed it. Kemp, you, you've, been with with Pixar uh, we didn't talk about on soul because here for the first time in 34 years they're making a film with a black protagonist and it occurred to someone that it might be nice to have a black you know person in the room <laughs> while you're coming it up with occurred that. to them yeah yeah <laughs> um, so yeah. I just I want to kind of just talk this through I know it's not always the most uh, comfortable conversation, but I think it's important. And so Rada, since it was literally addressed in your film, I wonder if we can start with you. Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me, it's not up for me, it's not my decision to decide who should tell what story. Uh, there was a time when I was performing a 
solo performance piece called Happy Flower Nail about all of these different women in a Korean owned nail salon in Brooklyn. And I played all the characters, the Korean woman, the Jamaican lady, you know. And, um, but I, I think because you don't, you know, when you're inspired, when the calling kind of comes on you to tell a story, you have this, this urgency around getting this thing out of you. I do think that there are ways to tell other people's stories responsibly. You know, like um, someone recently reached out to me on recommendations for writers for a writer room about a subject who was um, Asian. And I just said, are there Asian writers in the room? You know, because I just would think for me personally, if I'm talking about a world outside of mine, I want to pull in people from that world to help me authenticate it, you know, and to lean on them to um, just make sure I'm doing right by the culture, so to speak. So yeah, I don't think it's my role to decide, well, only white people should tell white, people, white stories and black people should tell black stories. But if you're going to do a story that is not germane to your culture, that you do your due diligence to make sure that people who are from that culture have a response to it and, and make it, um, you know, not just one person, <laughs> not just one black person, you know, but to pull in the community, so to speak, so that they get a chance to respond. And then you decide how you're gonna move forward from there, you know, you know knowing that you're probably gonna be scrutinized, you know? Um, but yeah, that's my opinion on it. It's like, people should write what they wanna write. I saw Danny Hawk do a play where he played every character under the sun. And I was on the edge of my seat waiting for him to do the older black woman character. And I got to tell you, it impressed me. The voice sounded very familiar to me, but Danny is someone who's going to go and do that work and make sure that people who look and feel like that woman have a response to the work. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, well, so Sam, before you respond, I just want to set it up a little bit more in the sense that Zendaya, I have read everything she's ever said about you she thinks you are the greatest thing ever uh john david a lot of every young actor i think would love to work with you at this moment so i mean nobody was forced to do something against their will here i just wonder if in your mind does it give you pause when you sit down and say wait a minute i'm telling a given given these conversations that are happening at you know around you uh to to tell a story with two protagonists of color and literally a two-hander of a film they're the only people in the movie um yeah look I, I mean i think a couple of things one when i sat down to write this i knew i was writing for for z and then i i had to think about okay who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with z um because she's such a formidable force what actor out there doesn't have, you know, I, I can't have someone who's got like a boyish sensibility because you, she would just snap that person like a twig. And so the only person I could think of was John David Washington. And I know his work from Monsters and Men and Black Klansmen and his sister, Katia Washington, someone I've worked with uh, as a producer on a number of projects. And he was the only voice that I heard. So now I was sitting down to write uh, a story about a filmmaker and his partner um, and, uh, and he's a black filmmaker in Hollywood. And I thought, well, what is he going to have nothing to say about the industry and about issues that he has? So I thought, you know, and, and look, and I think this is how I approach all writing. And it's why I love working with actors, um, is that I try to take something that feels true to me and honest to me. And I put it into a character and I have faith that throughout the process of filmmaking and sitting down, going over the script, reading it, rehearsing it, that whatever doesn't feel true, whatever doesn't um, work, whatever it might be, we're gonna figure that out in the room. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna look at it from every single angle because at the same time, I know that if I'm, as, as you know, as a white filmmaker, Jewish filmmaker, if I'm if I'm writing a black character, there's going to be a little bit more scrutiny. And I'm I'm good with that because I'm good with the process. And and I think that that's what's I don't know. I mean, look, I, I'm uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for anybody else or I don't want to speak for what should or should not be done because I don't really think about things that way. I just think about my own process. 
And I think that there's something about filmmaking that's very unusual, which is on a set, when you're going through a day and you're trying to figure out a scene, you're dealing with actors, you're dealing with producers, you're dealing with, you know, costume designers. And it's this collision of, of all different identities, races, backgrounds, orientation, and they're always bumping up against each other. And I think that it's part of the reason why diversity I think is so important in this industry is because you need all of these different perspectives and that if you're open to it and you're, and you're, you're paying attention and you're listening, that maybe you can try to bottle it all up and find something that feels universal. That's what's special to me about filmmaking. And, you know, and so I knew going into it that I had two great actors, but I also had two great producers um, in them. I also had, uh, you know, and so I, I had a lot of different voices that we knew we could all sit down and work this out and make it feel like it's something uh, that felt true and honest. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how I approach it. Yeah. Um... Kemp, just, you know, can you share how Pixar first even broached the, you know, hey, we're, we know who you are and we'd like you to come do what was it? You know, how did this, and it evolved over, you were with, you. it was a long period of time. Yeah, it was, uh, when I initially came on board, it was a 12-week writing assignment that turned into several years of my life and me being co-director. So, I, I mean, it's a really complex issue. I think that, of course, the internet and social media is always going to take things to the point of extreme outrage. If you listen to them, then not only am I only like most black filmmakers aren't even black enough to do black movies. Like, you know, like, no, no, no. there's, there's standards on the outrage of, of the Twitter that we're, we're trying, I need to discount here. It's important to understand though, that um, I th to me, what's important is that there's just opportunities created. It was not very long ago. And I'm talking like, I don't know, 24 months ago that it was very easy to get away with telling any story about any group of people if you're white and not having anyone from that group involved in any way, yep. shape or form and having zero accountability. That's fucked up. That's just yep. innately, and, and I'm not talking 20, 30 years, I'm talking like two years ago. You could have yeah. totally gotten away with it. Now, I think the desire of some people to overcorrect for that makes them say, it should only be if it's not a black writer and director and producer and, and then, then it doesn't work. And it's like, slow your roll on that one too. But it, that's the place that it's actually coming from. I came on board Soul two years into the film's development. So the question people should actually be asking is, wow, with no black people involved, you guys took the film for two years before a discussion even started about inviting a black artist in. Now, once I got in, and started working, it, it very quickly became clear to my collaborators how valuable my presence was. And I have to say, not just for the black characters, because <laughs> that's the other thing that the internet will do. They'll make it seem like everything in Seoul with black people Kemp did and everything else Pete did. The reality is as a writer, there's no scene in that film that me, Mike Jones and Pete Doctor didn't write or rewrite or retouch. Um, Pixar is incredibly collaborative. And we all put our personal experiences into this story. Like watching Sam's film, it was very evident within the first 10 minutes that exactly what Sam said, that he must have mistakenly not thanked his wife or partner. Like we, there's an autobiographical element that you just immediately see. But I think that's what it is. I think people, we weren't even, I, very early on in my career of six years ago, I sold a TV show with a writing partner who was white. And the show featured, a, it was mostly black characters. The show didn't get made. But I remember selling the show and being in the, in the meetings with executives and looking over to my buddy and saying, you know, man, this is gonna be really great for your career. And he said, what do you mean? I said, because of you working on this, you're gonna be seen as someone who speaks black. And there are gonna be opportunities that come to you that are not gonna come to me. And I'm okay with that. I know I'm going to have to go a different route to get where I'm going, but I'll get there. And the reality is I don't, I don't want to blow up because again, this is a very close friend of mine. The films and TV shows that he was offered as a white man off of our pilot was kind of stunning. It was like one project after another with black characters. He, he had a rubber stamp. Um, 
Meanwhile, I had to kind of like make the conscious decision not to do anything else with him as a writing partner in order to establish that my voice on my own was capable of telling the exact same stories. And that's what I had to do. I literally had to take a step back of several years and just do shit jobs to just show people that, yes, I was as much a part of that thing you loved as the person you assumed had come up with all those ideas. That's the reality of it. So again, I'm sorry for rambling, but you have to understand where it's coming from. But of course, as an artist, we can tell whatever story we want, but people are gonna be sensitive and we have to be sensitive to people's sensitivity. And, and I'm sorry, but the reason we're here is because of the history of it. Well, I, I think that the others said it better than, uh, than I can. Um, uh, so I, I wanna second what they said. Uh, I, I, I wanna say this, of course, any writer should be uh, a, able and allowed to tell any story. Um, uh, we, we don't wanna stop people from, uh, uh, from writing stories, uh, but you know, the others talked about involving other eyes, in, in, involving uh, other minds. Uh, so, you know, for instance, with Chicago 7, uh, two of the characters were Bobby Seale and Fred Hampton, uh, um, chairman of the uh, National Chairman of the Black Panther Party, Illinois Chairman of the Black Panther Party. And we'll all learn more about Fred Hampton in Black Judas and the Messiah. Um, I'm glad that that's coming out. Uh, so, I. Uh, you know, I showed early, I showed the script and then early cuts of the film uh, to black friends of mine uh, in the film community. But you have to be, uh, and, and I found myself, to be honest, consciously making sure that it wasn't just that I want Elvis Mitchell's seal of approval, uh, mm -hmm. that I want to be able to sit on a panel and said Elvis Mitchell uh, uh, said it was okay, uh, uh, what, what I had Bobby said, that I, I really want to uh, <laughs> listen to what he's saying. Um, and that I also, you don't want to make the assumption that because one black man right. said this, that he is <laughs> representing <laughs> all black men. And so ultimately, you have to have confidence in yourself uh, as a storyteller. Uh, you know, we're, it's not like we bring in a relief pitcher from the bullpen uh, to write the gay character if we're not gay or the female character if we're men or the black character if we're white. Well, I want to close with just a, another kind of big picture question, which is that America, but, the, the, you know, the whole world has been through a, a, a lot recently. But let's just I, I want to zero in on America for a second, because in the last 20 years, now 21 years, let's say, just over 20 years, 2000 election, 9-11, Great Recession, Trump, uh, a pandemic, what we just saw at the Capitol, which is essentially a coup attempt. Um, do you feel that this has affected the way that audiences go into movies? Are they more cynical? Are they more, do, do you have to, approach things differently. And I'm going to ask Aaron to start this one off just because the West Wing, one of the greatest shows in TV history, in my humble opinion, I wonder if it would work today because so much of what was great about it was its idealism. And this, I remember you, you left it feeling inspired. And now you look at what's become of this country and the Oval Office and its occupant and all of that. And I just wonder, you know, you've been, you're, you're the person who's been, I think, doing this for 20 plus years. So I would really like to start with you just about, do you feel that audiences have changed and, and the way you need to approach them has changed? Sure. And that was a nice way of calling me the oldest person. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have been asked before if, if, if the West Wing would work today. And I, I, I think that it would. Uh, I, and I'm not speaking at all to the quality of the show. Um, I, I didn't find the, the West Wing straddled the uh, Clinton and Bush uh, administrations, then had a whole new life on Netflix uh, uh, with Obama in, in, into Trump. Um, and there hasn't really been a difference in the way the audience has reacted to the show, depending on, uh, on who was in the Oval Office. 
Uh, look, fundamentally, with, with, with any television series, uh, the audience first wants to hang out with these uh, people every week. Um, and in, in, in the case of the West Wing, the idea was that, uh, by, by and large, in popular culture, uh, in, in this country and Emerald in, in the UK, uh, too, our leaders are portrayed either as Machiavellian or as dolts. Um, and so, uh, for a number of reasons, I just wanted to do a TV show where uh, uh, the characters were as committed and competent as the doctors and nurses on a hospital show and the cops on a cop show and the lawyers on a, uh, on a legal drama. Um, and uh, that, you know, seeing heroes without capes, uh, just people reaching for the stars, trying to do the right thing, losing as much as they win, slipping on banana peels, but always in the service of trying to do good. Uh, I, I, I just don't think that that's going to change depending on who's really in the Oval Office. Well, it's a lot to think about, and I just want to thank you. We're so lucky to have five amazing writers representing six amazing films, and I uh, can't thank you enough for your patience with us and for sharing such interesting uh, insights. Thank you all. Really appreciate Thanks very much. Thank Scott. you, Scott.